Hi, um, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where, depends on where you are. Thank you for joining this special edition of webcasts by Gal Derma. I'm Stephen Liu, I'm a plastic surgeon in Sydney. Um, thank you for tuning in. Today I want to talk to you about sub Q, wrestling sub Q. Um, the main reason for this webcast is we're trying to debunk some of the myth, some of the misconception that some of you may have overheard in the injectors community. Let me give you a little bit of a background of wrestling sub Q. Um, it's been available in Australia since 2006 and I have been one of the few fortunate ones to be involved uh, in using the product, in learning about the product since 2006. So cumulatively, cumulatively I've been using this product uh, for about seven years. Um, tonight I'm going to share with you what I know about the product and how I've been using it in my clinical practice on a day-to-day -day practice. Um, so it is interesting because in the last few years there seems to be some fear among some of you of using Restylane Sub-Q and some of the fear has been that it causes lumps, the product migrates, it's prone to infection and causes swelling. Um, historically, from my experience, this does not seem to be the case. So as I've mentioned, I've been using this product in 2000, from 2000, end of 2006 and the gentleman who introduced this product to Australia was a plastic surgeon from Italy, Professor Giuseppe Sito and some of you may have fortunate to have met up with this brilliant uh, individual. So in the last seven years, I have treated close to about 420 patients there has been only three cases of my personal complications. So some of you who know mathematics, this is a fairly, fairly small numbers. And what are some of the complications? The first one being product displacement, and I'll show you the case. There has been two cases of small nodules formation in the jawline, where the patient will just on passing by mentioned the two small nodules, not truly concerned by it. And I will talk a little bit about why that is so. Of the 420 cases that I've been involved with, majority of the patients, 70% of them, are used wrestling sub -Q in the mid phase, essentially to enhance their cheek. This could be from the lateral cheek or the mid cheek in some patients uh, who specifically need the augmentation in that region. And 30% of the patient are used for chin enhancement as well as for jawline rejuvenation or enhancement and nowhere else. So I want to share with you the technique that has been involved since its introduction in this country. So for the first two and a half to three years the technique that I've employed were essentially, for the mid-phase, were essentially an intraoral approach by using a large size cannula, essentially because that's what's available in those periods of time, an 18 gauge cannula, which that we hardly use nowadays. So it was an intraoral approach and I love it. And a group of my patients, they still like it today why? Well, why do I like it? Because if you think about conceptually, if you want to place a product onto the cheekbone and through the mouth, it is the closest, shortest approach to it. Because it's so close to the bone, you actually place it so deep, you can't go deeper than that, you get less irregularity and less palpability or even visibility of the product and create a very nice, smooth contour. That's why the patient like it not because they like it through the mouth, it's because of the effect of it. But I do accept and understand it is fairly difficult 
to teach and it has a very steep learning curve particularly if you are concerned about going through the mouth because as an aesthetic physician or surgeon this is something that we try not to to, to get too close to because you know it's a perceived invasiveness for this procedure and perhaps it's considered to be not very clean and it does take a little bit longer than a tr than what you guys or what we get used to now is transcutaneous but interesting enough there is still a group of patients even today will actually want to have this approach being used because of the the smooth the smoothness of the contour but having been in that particular uh, up using particular approach I feel that if you can use a percutaneous technique well there's no reason why we we cannot produce the same effect and still place it at the same plane and tonight I'm going to show you how I do it in my clinical practice what I want to do now is I want to share with you briefly what we did you know in 2006 2007 here we have an Asian patient and we mark up the patient as you would have done today with a technique through the skin so because we're going through the mouth we need to give them some nerve block and I routinely in those days use a uh, infraorbital nerve block almost like going to see a dentist with some local infiltration and I also infiltrate the zygomatical facial nerve just to provide some numbness in the upper cheek region and and then we let it sit and then we need to create a tunnel intraorally with an 18 gauge needle so like any cannula you need to create a opening with a sharp needle once again it was a huge needle 18 gauge and then we use an 18 gauge cannula okay and in order to create some tracks some tunnels for us to place the product at the end so we want to create as many tunnels as possible like what you see now notice that with enough anesthesia it's actually a fairly comfortable procedure so once I, I normally made about five to six tracks then with the same cannula I placed a product in and I basically because the track has been performed I basically slowly squirt the product into that particular cavity okay so no in particular direction just staying deep and place the product and then I mold the uh, the cheek in order to get the result that I want now I want to show you I move on to the another video so this is what I have so this is what I want to show you now um, this is something I prepared earlier a patient who just happened to have an endoscopic um, uh, mid parasol facelift where I make an incision in the mouth using the same cannula to create uh, the tunnel if we can play that movie again please first of all you can see in your view an infraorbital nerve you can see the tunnel and on the bottom of it you can see bone and at the 12 o'clock we're just going to play it once more so you can see on your view the nerve you can see tunnel and bone and some of the uh, mid cheek fat and some of the muscle overlying on the roof so it's actually a very deep placement of the product um, so interestingly you would have guessed that going through the mouth with saliva a big cannula quite a forceful track you will get you would assume to get a lot of swelling a lot of pain a lot of discomfort well in fact you don't and if we were to show you the next slide 
you will see that during that two, two and a half years, I've only had one complication. That is, a patient who has a small lump in the corner of the right lower lid due to product displacement. And I'll explain a little bit why. It's because of my technique and it's non-product related. It is very easy to blame the product but I think, you know, for an experienced and, and a professional injector, most of the time we should actually sit back and actually try to actually work out what went wrong. Um, so this patient, as you can see, this was taken at about three weeks after injection. She doesn't see this product in, in week two. It's only happened in week three. And this is clearly a subcutaneous or in this particular case the product is actually deep to the eyelid skin now how is that possible if you place it so deep right onto the bone and three weeks down the track the product actually gets there it's not because the product can move it's simply because the product's been displaced by repetitive normal physiological motion of the cheek we smile we eat we kiss that create compression in this particular case, obviously, in my process of creating the tunnel, I've actually gone a little bit too superficial, pierced through the orbicularis muscle or cheek muscle through the orbicularis muscle. And because of that little gap, even though the product was pulled quite deep on the bone with repetitive motion, contraction, smiling, the product will sometimes being squeezed through that tiny little gap into the pathway of least resistance. In this particular case, just happened to be through that tiny little gap within the muscle, obicularis muscle, and get into the subcutaneous tissue. Is it the product fault? Absolutely not. It is my technique. So let's move on to what do I do now and what do most of you do now? Well, because of I guess it's fairly hard um, 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 to teach and le steep learning curve and people can't get used to it. In fact, less of popularity, lack of demand. So I have converted into teaching it transcutaneously. I use, my preferred technique is um, use of cannula because um, I believe that particularly for someone who never had this done, you can actually do it gently with such a minimal discomfort. I don't use any blocks anymore. I don't use any creams. I just use a very small amount of local infiltration of the point of entry. And I will show you how much local anesthetic I use. So mid-face, I use 21 sometimes 22 gauge cannula or needle and same thing with jawline I use the same 21 and 22 gauge cannula or needle and there's a reason for using that particular gauge of course you can squeeze through sub-Q through a 25 gauge cannula but I would hopefully after this uh, webcast to convince you not to and there's a scientific reason for it so since I've changed the the technique from intraoral to through the skin, I have two minor complications. There are two small minor nodules on the jawline very close to the pre-jaw sulcus where there is paucity of soft tissue. Once again, it is non-product related because it is just simply my technique placing it inadvertently, not deep, it's just too superficial. It is very easy to inject the jawline coming from an area where it's fairly thick and you stay very deep to the bone and it's covered by your skin, your fat and your platysma muscle and underneath the platysma there is some preperiosteal or fat just on the bone. But right at the pre-gel, particularly elderly patient, where there's a transition out of the sun there's no soft thick soft tissue from the from the gel all you have is a little bit of 
uh, soft tissue and a small amount of uh, lower lip depressor and that's where the two cases was simply because I wasn't once again um, I wasn't consciously enough to place the cannula or needle right deep onto the bone so it's just another case of technical issue in the last few years too I have been referred quite a lot of cases and I just want to share with you and use this as a discussion point and perhaps use this as a starting point for some of you who may have uh, some issue with complication of sub Q so I have two cases of recurrent inflammation what it means is the patient will describe to me is they get some intermittent swelling and where it resolved with some antibiotic and after a few weeks a few months it came back again so the patient normally by the time they see me they would have had about three or four causes of antibiotic over a few months there's no abscess formation there's no really lumps and bumps to be seen when there's no inflammation there has been two cases of frank chick abscess um, that is you know presented with a localized classic infection redness boggy swelling and tenderness two cases of nodules close to the orbital ring that is visible and palpable and and uh, feel quite firm and one case of nodules in the jawline almost similar to um, what I have seen myself in my clinical setting except a little bit larger and is visible and I go through my management and some of the uh, photos of some of these cases uh, later on I just want now to talk a little bit about science because I think this is going to be the future in the next few years you will see that people start talking a lot more science of the product we will hear a lot more about the G prime the cohesivity the viscosity and the compressive force of the product and why that is important because that will determine where the product will be and should be used Resilience Sub-Q has a extremely high elastic modulus and, and you'll be familiar, most of you are familiar with the, the term G prime it describes the firmness of the product and Resilience Sub-Q has a G prime of 1000 kilopascal okay so what does it mean? it means that it is a quite a firm product and be able to withstand compression and in fact in Australia Resilience Sub-Q and for that matter in a lot of other parts of the world has the highest G prime of among all the other HA we also know that you know when we use product we want to create a lifting, a sculpting and volumizing of the part of the face that we want uh, to enhance and, and, and you're familiar with the use lifting capacity and we know that it depends on two main factors it depends on mainly on the G prime as well as how cohesive how sticky the product is so we know that the higher the G prime the higher or the better the lifting capacity and one of the other term I want to introduce to you is the so-called volume efficiency and you'll hear a lot more in the next few years what does that mean? it means that you can just use a certain amount of product and it's efficient in creating a certain volume okay and, and, and for instance if you you will not consider a wrestling vital to be something of a efficient or good volume efficiency because it's not designed to do so whereas wrestling sub Q with a high G prime has a very good and one of the best volume efficiency among all the HA so resonance sub Q knowing that it has a very very high G prime a great volumizer of course it's designed to place it deep and what I mean by deep it depends on where you're talking about so the two places that's been designed to use is basically the mid face as well as the jawline so in this particular area you want to put it so close to the bone 
And in some patient who has, who has minimal soft tissue, you want to absolutely show that you're on the bone. And of course, in some patient with quite a uh, moderate amount of soft tissue, you can get away with it by placing them in the deep subcutaneous plane. But do not, and it is certainly not designed to be placed under the skin or in the skin for that matter, because you will get 100% um, uh, nodule summation. And once again, you know, if that happened, it is not because of the product, it's because it is being placed in an incorrect plane. So the owners, I think we as an injector, needs to take a lot of that responsibility in ourselves in order to use this product accurately, use it the way it's being designed for, so that we can get a maximum result for our patient with minimal, hopefully no complication. Um, too much sound background. Then. So, I coin Resilence Sub-Q essentially as a soft tissue or soft filler implant in a syringe. It is designed, as you can see later on, for a cheek. It's almost like you're creating, you're placing a cheek implant via syringe or chin implant for that matter because it just creates a very nice outline um, of the cheek. It is not suitable for superficial placement. Let's now look at this uh, microscopic view. You can see that it is a very uniform particles. There, you can see the particle and this is Restylane Sub-Q. So let's recap it has an elastic modulus of 1000 kPa, or G prime, and it has fairly large molecule, as you can see. It has the biggest molecule compared to Restylane, and Restylane Perlane, certainly a lot bigger than Restylane Vital and Vital Light and Lip. So it's been designed as a volumizing agent. It needs to be delivered in its natural form. And I'm aware that some clinician intentionally try to modify it or try to assume they can modify it by squeezing it through a smaller needle and cannula. My feeling is, you, of course you can do that. And I mentioned before, you can actually put Restylane sub through a 30 gauge um, needle through a 0.3 mil syringe. Of course you can drill it. If you can generate no pressure, it will squeeze through it. But the fact that you can squeeze through it does not mean that it will behave like a smaller particle uh, wrestling product, like wrestling perlane, vital, and anything. Because it just doesn't work that way. You cannot modify the G prime by squeezing through. All you're doing is you are distorting the molecule of uh, the wrestling sub -Q. So I just want to emphasize the last point because it is important. And I am certainly aware that some of the complication I'm seeing as a result of some of these presumed modification. So it does not change the G prime, i.e. The, 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 the product that come out from a 26 gauge needle are still still has a very high G prime and as a result if you're trying to if you think in your mind that you are squeezing through a smaller needle and you can you can use it in the skin or superficial subcutaneous tissue you are going to run the, the trouble just like you're squeezing through a 21 gauge needle and place it subcutaneously or s under the skin you will feel the lump just like you will feel it if you squeeze through a 30 gauge uh, needle via a 0.3 um, mil syringe and what do you see you get implant probability you get lumps and you get bumps and the patient will come back so we know that Nasha family is a product with minimal modification of the structure and 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 because it is low cohesivity it has a high G prime so when you squeeze through, 
a 25 or 26 gauge needle with a small syringe you will create a high velocity and you will shear the product you will deform the product and you will dissociate and fracture and fragment the resonant sub -Q into smaller chunk at a greater velocity in distant sites away from the main area of volumization and that's why I think that if you were to modify this product sometimes you can see a small pocket of product far away from the area of your main injection site why? for the same reason that if you generate so much pressure from the plunger from the end of the tip of your, can of your needle and that small fragment squeezed through from the main bulk it will shoot through with such an intense velocity it will be displaced far away and that's why sometimes the patient come back and create a lump it's not because of migration it's just once again because of what we have what we've been trying to be too smart and trying to modify the product let's go and do the complication that I've seen so what have I done with it? The two cases of recurrent um, inf inflammation sorry uh, um, I'm so sorry I'm going to skip through that we'll come back to that later let's have a look at uh, some of the cases that um, you will see um, you will see on your screen a patient um, with abscess uh, it's an unfortunate lady who have a abscess that was ignored even by some specialists simply because it, they didn't recognize there was actually discharging the pus coming out so whenever you have pus you will want to drain this so this was this patient who has this pus coming out that required to be drained surgically and this was the next case where the patient presented with recurrent um, infection where the swelling is coming up we eventually have to um, uh, resort to open drainage because despite the fact that we drain it with needle it just keeps accumulating it is important to act fairly quickly and if you can't treat this yourself I would suggest you refer to someone fairly quickly simply because when you get such an intense reaction it eats away a lot of the subcutaneous fat the longer you leave them um, so we want to reduce minimal um, um, deficit even after we drain them so let's have a look at some of the complication uh, that I am seeing now okay if we can just so we have two cases of recurrent inflammation so in the first case I have to just put the patient on oral antibiotic and, and the type of antibiotic I use um, are fairly consistent I tend to use um, an, um, Keflex or uh, oral Dicloxicillin 500 milligram four times a day for about two weeks and I also add uh, suprafloxacin to cover some of the potential gram negative and I use uh, 500 milligram twice a day for about two weeks um, in some patient where the um, infection is not responding I will sometimes add uh, Zitromax which is a, um, um, a form of macrolide um, antibiotic um, I cannot uh, remember the dose on top of my hand but you can certainly find it in the MIMS um, once again for about two weeks and then once I got that control I will high laze them and I will continue the antibiotic for another two weeks in case number two I actually have to resort to open drainage uh, surgically just to clean it out and put continue the antibiotic in the two cases of cheek abscess it was a fairly straightforward you just have to go in and do most of the time you can help with an intraoral uh, incision to drain it to really flush it out and sometimes I actually leave the wound completely open um, 
and of course continue the antibiotic. Um, two cases of nodules close to the orbital rim. Now it's interesting, these are the patients that were sent to me because it was felt they are resistance to um, hyaluronidase. Now when you have a nodule formation, particularly if this is six or seven weeks or two months down the track, the body form a hard fibrous nodules around it and if you just place hyalase in the surrounding area because of the dense fibrous tissue um, encapsulating the hyaluronic acid it's not going to penetrate through that thick capsule so in those cases it is important to actually put a fairly large needle under some topical uh, some local anesthetic and, and I tend to use an 18 gauge needle go straight down there aspirate it with one mil syringe and sometimes squeeze the product out and only then I place a little bit of high lace within the lesion and that's to absorb it and you'll find that that tends to dissolve the problem uh, in 100% of the cases though so that is a good uh, um, uh, tip to remember if you feel a nodule is not infective don't be too afraid to clean the skin and stabilize it with, um, with your finger and, and just pinpoint accuracy put a, a sharp needle through it and aspirate it and then or squeeze the product out and then highlight it and there's one case of large nodule once again aspirate it as what I mentioned before and highlight it so these are some of the cases of mine that you know some of you would have seen it before a 30 year old wanting a bigger chick and you can certainly create it with a minimal uh, volume of product uh, these are more classical patients in their 30 to 40 where they show some mild um, mid volume mid chick volume deficit you can certainly create a beautiful chick a very soft very very smooth looking um, sculpted chick uh, with a small volume of product these are the classic where they have a severe volume deficiency you can enhance them you can create a wow factor with just a correct placement of product and this particular uh, patient all she need was just a 1.5 uh, mil on each side and, and once again even a thin patient like this if you place it deep if you place it deep you can create a very nice product uh, result and then 70 year old once again you know the older the patient I tend to use less product because they don't need so much product to actually make them look good for their particular age and and some of the other cases I do is patient like this with a contour uh, problem uh, she has the so-called witch's chin so in this particular uh, case we want to relax uh, the chin with uh, toxin um, and then once we've done that we want to place the product not in the chin itself but just along the side of the chin in order to smooth out to reduce that concavity in that particular region as you have seen here and chin enhancement is one of the other area where the wrestling sub -Q works very well because the chin pad in particular is a very stiff and very very firm area because of the thick and fibrous mentalis muscle so you do need something that is has a high G prime in order to create the projection that you like for that patient so if you look at it now you can see the degree of uh, projection that we managed to create so in summary resonance sub Q is is highly volume efficient product because of its uh, G prime it is ideal for sculpting the cheek chin and jawline it is not designed for use to use it in the tear trough it is not designed for use to use it in the nasal labial fold or to decan it through a small um, syringe for use use it in the skin it just you can do it but you're going to run into problem with it for the reason that I have described before um, to me because of its volume efficiency and its ability to shape the mid face it is best seen in patients who have a slightly thicker and heavier soft tissue where you know 
in order to create the shape, to create the volume and create the lifting, you do need something with a high G prime in order to overcome the heaviness of of um, a soft tissue. So for subcutaneous to work effectively, it needs to be delivered with a suitable size cannula and needles, in 21 gauge uh, or even 22 gauge cannula. It needs to be placed deep with adequate soft tissue coverage and I've always stressed that you want to do things slowly and gentle and precise. Even with the cannula, you can inadvertently create a track when you introduce the cannula to area where you may not necessarily want the product because once the product's in there, when you start molding them, it will be shifted into that area. So please place it, you know, deep. So it is now I just want to show you um, the example um, this patient that we're going to treat uh, tonight um, she is a 42 year old healthy young lady who has a uh, background history of uh, severe um, acne as a result, there's a lot of scarring, there's a lot of scarring and um, as you can see, it doesn't, when I show the patient, I want to demonstrate to you the soft tissue is fairly heavy set. So if you, on first glance, you will notice that she has a fairly square trapezoid type of facial shape and without even asking the question just looking at a photo you can you can almost you know guess that she probably used her masseter muscle a lot and this has certainly been confirmed with the patient on questioning the other thing that's obvious is you see that there is a fairly obvious tear trough uh, formation as well as an infraorbital hollow and and I'm not sure whether you can appreciate there is also a bit of uh, flattening of the mid face more so on the right than the left and I'll clarify it and I'll show you a little bit more when we see the patient live. It is important when you treat this sort of patient mid face you need to actually talk to a little bit about the patient because they will while they are going to get a very nice sculpted cheek what you also need to be warn the patient is suddenly with a nice cheek they will suddenly focus all the attention to the tear trough and unless you actually consult the patient telling them that you know you will know this is also a problem they will of course feel that it is the product causing the hollowing of the tear trough so in this case I would normally tell the patient that both the cheek and the tear trough needs to be treated and in an ideal world, I would treat them at the same time. If you decided not to treat the tear trough for whatever reason, it is important at least in your consultation mention that so that the patient's aware this is another area that needs to be looked at. So I'm now going to get the patient to come in. And while you are there on your screen, you will see that um, you will see that there are the oblique view of the patient. You see the right and left oblique view. Okay. So now I want to talk, do a thorough, a brisk. Um, assessment of this patient. I'm just going to have a pen. So this is Vanessa. Let's say hello to everyone, Vanessa. Hi. So Vanessa is a healthy 42 year old lady. If we can bring the camera in a little bit more, just zoom in. So Vanessa, what I want you to do is look, just concentrate. So if we can zoom in as much as possible, please that's it perfect okay so 
Vanessa is very healthy. Vanessa does not have any background autoimmune condition or anything. So if we can just focus on this now, just turn for me. If we can zoom in, please just concentrate in this area as much as you can. I'm not sure whether you can appreciate she has the effect of a teenage acne scarring, depending even more. Okay, so you can see there are some scarring from the previous acne scarring. Okay, look around there for me. All right, so come back a little bit more now, camera. So on first look, we have commented that she does have some acne scarring. Just relax for me. Just concentrate now, Vanessa, into that camera for me. Just keep focusing on that camera. If you can zoom in a bit more so that the cutoff point is at the chin. And show me a bit of forehead now. No, just sorry. You have to pan out. Show the whole face, but from the hairline to the chin. That's it. Okay. So first thing is, we talk about the facial shape and you can see she has some fairly deep resting line on the forehead that will require attention with um, botulinum toxin. She has a very good eyebrow shape. She has, in fact if there's anything, she has quite a prominent temporalis muscle there's no concavity there. Moving down to the middle third, which is what we're going to focus on. Let's zoom in a bit more now. Just concentrate between the eye and the top lip. Let's get to zoom in more. Bit more. Bit more. Too. Okay. All right. Um, I, I just need to see both sides of the face. Okay, zoom in a bit more now. Okay, perfect. So you can see, just relax on your lip now. Good. You can close your eyes now if you want to. Just close your eyes, relax on your lip. Okay. Just open your eyes now gently. You can see, first of all, there's tear trough on both sides, worse on the right than the left. I'm not sure whether you can appreciate. See, it's certainly a lot flatter on the right cheek than the left. You can almost certainly be sure she's lying on the right hand side. Okay. All yes, right. I do. Yeah. So just relax now. So, and then moving down to the lower part of the face, we've mentioned about the, the hypertrophy and the hyperactivities on the master muscle. And if we were to get uh, Vanessa to confirm, she does in fact clench her teeth significantly. And once again, if you look at it, you know that it's worse on the right side than the left. And apart from that, you know, she has a beautiful jawline, okay? And she has a fairly, you know, it's a quite an um, aesthetically ideal lip with a nice cheap outline, cheek outline and a fairly good uh, proportion to her cheek, except with a tiny bit of some shadowing in the oral commissure, which we will talk about in a different session. Now, just look at me a little bit now. Okay, you can zoom up a little bit more now. Zoom out a little bit more, please. We need to zoom out a little bit more. Okay, okay. let's get it focus. Okay, I just need you to concentrate between the eye and the lip. Okay, all right, so just concentrate. So I'm going to, this is how I, I mark the patient. I like to just draw some guideline and just this just happened to be what we call a hindra line. Okay, on both sides. Sorry, I might just block your view. Okay. 
So now you can see, just look into the camera now. And then we know that there is some volume deficit here. That's why it's fairly flat. It's not as bad here. The next thing I like to do is I tend to wanting to look at the patient in an oblique view. Just turn towards me and shift the camera so we can see this, please. Where my finger is. Good. Okay. So you can see that this is almost a straight line and it will be nice to create a bit of a gentle curve for her, just like this. Okay, so that's how I'm going to decide where I'm going to replace the volume but also to enhance the cheek a little bit. So this is where, look straight into the camera now, okay. The other good tip to use is get the patient, just look at the camera, okay. Can we show both sides of the cheek please, okay, and pan in a bit more. Okay, that's it, it's good, okay. So gentle smile for me in the camera, just relax. See that apple of the cheek? enhance it, it will confirm where you want to enhance it for the patient. Relax now. And the other way is, use your finger to actually simulate the result you want to create. This is all confirmation of what you're trying to achieve. So from there, I know that most of my product need to be around here, in this region. Okay, let's repeat the same process in this part. Now it is important, we mentioned that this patient has tear trough. If you place a product all the way up here, notice what will happen is the tear trough is going to be a lot worse. And we know that the cheek doesn't go all the way up to the orbital rim. So from there is a slow gentle slope from the orbital rim to the apple of the cheek. That's what we want to create. Okay. So having mark the patient. The next thing we want to do is in this particular case I'm going to demonstrate how I use the cannula. So you want to place the injection point at least a centimeter from the um, from the injection site. Let's come in. Okay, let's zoom in a bit more now please. Concentrate onto this area. So you can see this will be where my injection point is at least about a centimeters from it. The other um, thing that I've commonly seen is patient, people put a lot of product up there and if you look at most of the even a supermodel cheek there's really not a lot of widening in that region and sometimes you create too much width there and it's not very aesthetically normal to have so much fullness on the cheek area, the zygomatic arch. So once again we want to place about a centimeters. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how I actually do um, the injection. So before the injection, um, normally routinely I put them on 500 milligram of Keflex just as a single dose. Sorry, one gram of Keflex as a single dose. Just sit up a bit for me. I'm just going to set her up. Lie back for me now. Good. Lie all the way back. So you want to actually make them very, very comfortable. You also want to be so comfortable for yourself when you're doing the procedure because after all, if you're not comfortable, you can't do it efficiently. Okay. So while we're setting up, we'll get you to move the camera closer to the patient. Can I take my boots off? No, no, no. Let's leave it there. We're just going to get you over and rest it. Yeah, <laughs> you can rest the legs down now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uncomfortable. <laughs> good, come in now, so that your camera is okay, so that your camera is almost straight onto the cheek. Come zoom in now. 
Good. Too much. Too much. Too much. Slow down. Slow. Slow. Pan out. Pan out for me. Okay. Now, if you can just zoom in now, so you can see this part. Okay. A bit more. If you can, okay, that's fine. Right, uh, so of course you want to make sure that your hand is nice and clean. The whole process is you want to clean the face of all the makeup as we have done here, not even the mascara. We want to remove most of those things. That beforehand, and we normally just sort of wipe the skin with some chlorhexidine, the antiseptic of your choice, before I even treat the patient. The next thing is I'm just going to put a small uh, amount of uh, local anesthetic in this patient and let's give me a blue thing. So, <clears throat> okay. so here we have a chlorhexidine impregnated gauze that's once again for local anesthetic so here I have a 0.3 mil syringe. I like to use um, um, local anesthetic 1% with adrenaline. That's my preference for two reasons. To eliminate any risk of bruising from my injection site. So I have marked where my injection site, you can see it. And of course you want to not place a product through where your marking is. So just be close. So this is the only uncomfortable bit and we know that because of her acne scarring the skin's going to be a little bit fibrousy. So, so I'm only going to use 0.1 mil for this patient. So put some in the skin because that's the way that they will feel the most. And then I slowly in an anti-gray fashion gone down to the bone I have used slightly more than 0.5 so I will move on the other side now same thing cleaning small amount of local anesthetic some in the skin, just a very small amount, that's the most painful bit. A little bit more, deeper in the subcutaneous plane and advance the needle down to the bone. You can feel it and put some just in that area. Okay, so while I'm doing that, while I'm waiting for the local anesthetic to work, this is the time that I really want to clean the skin and this is not a sterile procedure but we certainly want to be absolutely sure that we are um, as I need a bit more chlorhexidine we're absolutely you know as clean as possible <coughs> so this once again is um, chlorhexidine impregnated quite a lot of it and I will tend to particularly where I know the cannula might be touching the skin and I'll try not to, I just want to put as much sterility in this procedure as possible. Once again, clean the surrounding skin where I'm going to do it. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to... Okay. Um, so with the modern technology, I believe that when this webcast, you guys can, and I encourage you to um, send me or email me some questions uh, as I go along. The first question was specifically what complication have I seen? And I believe I've certainly covered that in the, in the lecture. The, in the last seven years, seven and a half years, I have three cases. One was the product displacement on the uh, lower eyelid because of my technique of inadvertently um, penetrate through the orbicularis muscle 
and hence with the um, compression of the muscle um, I create a product uh, in the lower eyelid and the other two cases uh, in the last five years has been um, a small nodules in the jawline which the patient mentioned but I did not do anything because it doesn't really bother the patient they just want to know that it's going to be okay and you know that in those small nodules that doesn't bother the patient uh, if you leave it long enough they will tend to um, uh, resolve on its own accord. This is obviously different compared to those huge big um, nodules uh, that I've been referred. Now we just want to concentrate close-up view now before I inject. So if we can just zoom in a little bit more please just around here. Okay now you will probably appreciate a bit of blanching in this area from my local anesthetic. That's one of the reasons um, that I use this. Now I apologize, I'm a Michael Jackson fan. I tend to use one um, uh, glove. I, when I inject, I change it to a sterile glove. Um, and the one with the glove is the only part that touches the patient, the sterile glove. And my finger is just an area, it's just the, the hand that I use to do something not that important where it doesn't touch the sterile part of the needle. Once again, this is more of a habit because of my, um, you know, I like to be able to have an unimpaired tactile feeling. Okay, so it's important. Now, you're going to, I'm going to use a 21 gauge cannula. It is important to use a suitable size needle as an introducer. There's no point using a 25 gauge introducer or needle and create a 25 gauge hole where you're going to fit in a large cannula or larger cannula. You simply are going to create too much of a blunt uh, force to, in order to engage um, that particular small hole. So try to be atraumatic as possible. Try not to force things along. So So I'm going to put it down to the bone and as you can see on your view there is a 21 gauge cannula through there and how you feel doing? Good. You okay? Yeah. So big smile for me. Big smile. Relax. Yeah. You can see the needles moving. So why is the needle moving? Well two reasons. One, the muscular, particularly the orbicularis when the moving, the contracting is actually moving the needle. So then what I've done, what I would like to do is I want to create a track. So I would aim where I'm going to place the cannula. And this is the bit that I stretch the opening a little bit as well as stretch the track a little bit to make it easier for me to introduce uh, the, the product. So let's have the product now. So here we have um, Let's show the other camera. Oh, here we go. Um, a 21 gauge uh, pixel cannula, and all of you know the orientation, the advantage of it. And the important thing is, you know that when you inject through this, can you zoom in now for me, please, onto the cannula? I'm not sure whether you can see it. Okay, the product just flows through easily with hardly any force. And that's what we want. We want the product to actually come out with minimal uh, force so that it doesn't accidentally being uh, uh, propelled into area we don't want it to be. So we'll take the needle out. And, and f this is probably the hardest part, okay, to finding that hole that you created. Once we've done it, you want to lift up the cheek, so I'll get the patient to move to the left a little bit more for me. Okay, and zoom up a little bit for me. That's a maximum zooming. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a bit that if you can't get through, you want to do a almost like a corkscrew thing, and you will feel the first through. Okay. 
and okay, you will feel a give because you've actually trying to engage and penetrate through the orbicularis muscle. Now once you do that and we want to make full use of the fact that you've got a bit of lidocaine in the product, in the sub-Q and, and then I do a lot of anti-grade injection as well as retrograde. What sort of injection you do, it doesn't really matter as long as you place the product right where you want it. So you know that at this stage the patient is fairly comfortable so with a gentle lifting motion and constantly aware that I'm actually touching the bone and you're advancing it. Okay, how are you feeling Vanessa? Good. Fairly comfortable? Yes. Okay. You don't have to say it just because you're on the stage. Okay. All right. You can say ouch if you want to, it's okay. if you're in pain. So, so by the way, Vanessa never had this sort of product done before procedure done before. Yeah. So, so this is what I tend to, you can see, do it on a daily basis. This is, you can actually, you just want to do it so effortless and so comfortable, make the patient feel so comfortable because if the patient is in pain, you feel pressure to want to finish this procedure so quickly. So once again, I don't, I'm actually not squirting a lot, just a very slow and having a look where you are and advance the needle a little bit closer. So this is where the cannula is, okay? And as I'm doing it, I'm slowly, slowly injecting. And if, okay, I'm not sure whether you can appreciate the contouring that I'm seeing now. So now I'm withdrawing, I'm going for the second track. Still doing a little bit of anti-grade injection. Okay, so it, you just turn to the left a little bit more for now, so you can see perhaps now the sculpting, the lifting of the cheek, creating a very nice cheek mound for this patient. Okay, that's about what I feel is adequate. Just turn towards the camera now. So this is a cheek compared to the other side. Pan out a little bit more for me. So you can see the difference in terms of the projection. Of course, I've just withdraw the cannula. I have not done any molding compared to this side. Okay, so you can see the nice cheek mount and pretty atraumatic, a slow process and I have just used up to slightly more than one mil. So if you can pan in now, so have a look at the amount of product on the syringe. I have just passed the one mil mark, I'm not sure whether you can see it there. Okay, so I'll pass the product back and I have a dry gauze piece. So we just want to clean the entry point, relax now. With this, I'm just going to gradually, once again, there's not much of the pressure required to actually mold and sculpt the thing. And if I can now just clean up the mailer, Okay, if we can then pan in now a bit more. 
okay. we can see suddenly it's got a slightly rounder <coughs> cheek area for you okay and also I'm not sure everybody appreciate you appreciate more is we're creating a little bit of a submalar favorable submalar shadow is created almost like the a very very modern sort of model type of appearance so now I'm going to go over to have a look um, to see whether there's any questions that need to be answered okay while we're waiting for that questions I'm just going to go ahead and inject the other side now once again if we can have another um, chlorhexidine gauze please so as you as you can see I really truly emphasize how important it is to actually continue to use a lot of um, chlorhexidine I constantly use it to depth particularly the area I know is where I'm going to introduce <coughs> the cannula now let's have a sharp thank you okay that's a new needle I've just been informed so once again okay, let's zoom in a bit more if you can where I'm going to place a needle okay you okay so, so once again slowly 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 place it this is down to the bone once more we can feel it and I just want to go and open it up that space a bit okay okay this is a brand new so once again I just have a new strange with primer so once again give the area a bit of a wipe okay now it is important when you do this part or similar when you use cannula it is a fairly long cannula to be aware of where the cannula is touching because this is the bit that will go into the patient's tissue it is very important it is so important for you not to contaminate this area at all particularly resting on the skin okay so notice that I keep wiping it with chlorhexidine and I'm once again I'm going to pinch okay I'm in the um, the opening I'm going to engage the orbicularis muscle this is where you're going to feel a little bit of resistance and you're going to feel some uh, a pop or some giveaway and then once you've done that you want to put a little bit of a product there just to make it comfortable for the patient okay mm -hmm. so this is the part that once you see that the patient's feeling some you just want to slow it down a little bit because it has a lidocaine it's just within about two or three seconds it will numb that area once you've got that that's when you want to go in a bit more engage it how are you feeling now okay so I am do a very slow anti-grade injection placing the product where I have already pre-marked now it's one of the things that I feel that it is good practice to start marking the patient because as soon as the patient lie down the area of volume deficit will appear differently compared to when they are sitting up or standing okay how are you doing good. Vanessa? Good so once again you can actually do it fairly effortless without creating too much of a issue for the patient
So in this particular patient, this side, I've just used it, we just concentrate on the cannula now please, on the syringe. So I've used just one mil, and on the other side I've used 1.25 mil. Okay. So for patients who never had any of this done before, I tend to be err on the slight conservative side because it's easier for us to come back and replenish a bit more. Let's have a let's have a dry gauze now. Okay, once again I am going to do a bit of molding. And then when I am fairly happy with the way things are sitting, I will sit the patient up just to have a look before I fully convince myself that I've completed the procedure. So the next thing I'll do is I'll get you to sit up a bit for me now. Yep. Okay. And we will just have to move the camera back now. Okay, so if we can, just no smiling. I know you're very happy. <laughs> I have to refrain you from smiling right now. Just relax a bit for me. Okay, relax a bit on your cheek. Relax. Okay, so just lift up your chin a bit for me now. Okay, first thing is getting old, I have to change my glass. Okay, so first thing I want you to concentrate now is the cheek has some 3D structure now. The first thing you notice is suddenly there's a little bit of favorable shadow through here, which from my discussion with the patient, that was what we want to achieve. It creates it's almost like a creating a blush, chemical blush type of look. Okay, just relax a bit for me now. So we certainly improve that. Similarly, we've done the same thing on this side. Um, and if we were to look at the patient now on, on a three-quarter shot, just bring your cheek down a bit. And you can appreciate suddenly from a very sharp straight line, there's now a slightly gentle curve in here. Okay. Let's look back a bit more. Oh, yeah. So from where I'm sitting, I feel that it is a little bit flatter here compared to this side. So I will go back to treat this side now just to complete. So following this, I will start treating the, the uh, tear trough for this patient. So let's complete your treatment now. Let's lie back. We'll do a bit of chlorhexidine, please. Just a little bit more. Okay. So, sometimes your system can be very stingy with chlorhexidine, and you have to get them to be a bit more generous. Thank you. So I really like to basically flood that area with a lot of chlorhexidine. So we will use the cannula again, please. Yep. Okay. So just relax for me now. Thank you. So introduce the cannula back to the same track. Once again, we need to, once again, we need to engage the orbicularis muscle. Okay. How are you doing? Good. I can't feel a thing. Good. So the patient just said she couldn't feel a thing with the cannula throwing it. 
So sometimes when you come medially, as you encroach the infraorbital nerve, this is a place that you want to be even slower because they can be a bit uncomfortable as you get medially towards the medial limbus because that's where the nerve is. So the same trick, you want to put a bit of product in there. Wait for a few seconds before you place more product. Okay, so that will complete the injection in the mid cheek. So while we're doing that, there's a question, how long you wait to place... The question was, how long do you have to wait to place more product if the volume result is less than desired? Are there any problem in doing this? Um, well, you can place the product. Well, normally, um, I would, I would, you know, it's just, it's just how practical you can. You can, in theory, place a product tomorrow, but most patients will have a slight degree of swelling the next day. So I normally say come back within about 10 days, in 10 days or two weeks, and I'll reassess the patient, and that's where I'll place more product in. Uh, I don't think there's any, pr any problem of doing this is something that we routinely and uh, and, I, and I'm, I routinely do it in my practice and I'm sure a lot of you do it in your practice uh, on a, a daily as a matter of routine. So and because we have introduced a fairly big size uh, opening in the in the um, um, in the cannula side, if you zoom in now for me, please. Okay, so I like to place a small flesh tone color um, dressing just to cover it. Okay, just to cover it, just once again in order to reduce the risk of contamination of that side and I, how long do I leave this for? I normally tell them uh, leave it on for about three or four hours if they can or, if, or overnight if they can and then take it off before they go to work the next day just so that to allow sufficient time for the cannula side to heal up itself because the patient most of the time would like to put some makeup on after you know a few hours or a few days so my routine is I would prefer them not to have any makeup in that region now if they really have to that's when this dressing is very useful it will prevent any contamination so I normally say put this on put the makeup around the uh, dressings because it's flesh tone, okay? Um, the next thing is I want to I want to actually get you to zoom in through here now okay, just open your eyes up okay so if you look now, this patient, if I can show both sides, please. Okay, uh, zoom out a little bit. Good. So she has a infraorbital hollow and some tear trough here and come all the way to the lateral of the rim. So I like to use, um, in terms of product, in this case, a restylane perlane in this case. Corrected. You can use Restylane product if you want to, and that's your choice. Uh, I just like a, a product pearling in this region. So the next thing is lie back down now. Now I hope that I managed to answer the last questions uh, fully for whomever who posed that questions. That's been that's been answered. So if there is any further questions, so now we want to concentrate on injection of the tear trough. 
So once again, the same technique, clean it. I like to actually get the patient to open their eyes. Okay, bring your chin down a little bit. Good. Okay, are you fairly comfortable? Yep. Okay. So if you are going to inject tear trough and if you are using needle, and, and most of the time after you've done the Mela injection, part of the branches of the infraoperative nerve has been anesthetized and that will help. And if you actually do this as a standalone, the best injection point will be at the area of the medial limbus. Just look, open your eyes. Medial limbus is junction between the iris and the sclera, which is right here. If you put your finger here, you will feel the infraoperative foramen. Okay, so it's not at the mid pupil. So that will be the first place that I want to place a product because if I put a small amount of product there, okay, they will feel the needle initially, relax, okay, and I just put a small, small, small product there and wait. Get you to open your eyes for me. I like them to open their eyes so that it will delineate the, the area a bit better. So once I've done it, I'm still going to advance it, anti-grade, staying deep. And that's it. Okay? And then do some gentle molding in that area. Okay? Right. And then once we've done that, we're just progressively moving a little bit more laterally once again going from low feeling the bone and then put a small drop of product and constantly get the needle moving as I'm injecting I'm moving towards my previous injection site Slowly, slowly, slowly placing the product. Okay. Gentle molding. Relax a bit for me now, thank you. And I can see, I just want to have a look at the monitor now. Good. And, and just look straight in the camera now. Good, relax a bit for me. And I'm not sure I can appreciate the dark circle and slowly, slowly being softened and erased. So the next thing is, so past that point, that's an area not supplied by the infraorbital nerve. It is supplied by the zygomedical facial. Now the fact that we put a small amount of product here, hopefully it will reduce the discomfort, but most of the time they may still feel a little bit of a tiny little prick in that region. So once again, let's see. Okay, down to the bone. And lift up the soft tissue and inject along the bony margin in an anti-grade fashion. And I found that that's the area, the lateral margin is the place that I tend to use a little bit more product simply because this is where the muscle, apart from here, is tightly bound to the zygoma. You find that you tend to use a bit more product in that region because it's fairly tight. It doesn't get a separation in that area that easily. Okay. You're doing very well. How are you doing? You okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Relax a bit for me now. So what I'm trying to do now is trying to improve that demarcation between the eyelid and the cheek. So once again, we want to go in there and go straight down <coughs> to the bone and then lift up the soft tissue like what I've done there, knowing exactly where you are and slowly inject anti-grade fashion.
So teardrop region is an area that I tend to not fully correct because there will be small amount, a very small amount of post-injectable swelling. Okay, now. Okay. So if we can now compare to the other side, please, both sides. Okay, <coughs> zoom in a bit more. Okay you can just appreciate the deep hollow, the dark shadow come in a bit more, come in a bit more, 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 more keep zooming in to under the eyelid good, okay good, perfect, you can see that how much improvement we've created to soften up the shadowing, the hollowing in the omphalo margin to blend the eyelid and cheek junction okay so I'm now going to go to the next side. I'll change the needle first. <coughs> if there's any other questions, uh, please feel free to email us the questions. Any other questions? You have to bring it out for me, I can't. Okay. So, once again, for those of you looking at the screen, I'm just putting small amount of product just at the level of the infraorbital, sorry, at the medial limbus. Okay, I'm just going to let it sit for five seconds because that's where the branches of the nerve is so Bernice I'll get you to have a look at the screen because I'm back to the monitor I can't just make sure that the audience can see my injection yeah. how are you doing now okay okay so if you just do it slowly and allow the product to anesthetize the branches of the infraorbital nerve now I'm it will be a lot more comfortable. So I'm skirting along the orbital rim just to improve the tear trough. The, you can certainly do the, infra, uh, the tear trough with cannula, but it's an area that I, um, I, I have now moved back towards um, the use of needle because I don't I have not seen, I'm fully convinced at least, that it reduced the, the bruising that much in this area. And I found it's a bit more difficult to get into the correct plane with cannulas. Okay. And just to finish off, we'll just come from the lateral margin. on the bone and lift up the muscle and just inject as I go along. And for those of you who have heard Michael Caine, this is where he talk about that V-shaped thing and it's actually not a bad idea to put a small amount of product in this region, deep, just to efface that pro okay so no I'm good I just need a dry gauze please so the next question the next question was how many cases <coughs> Have you had complication with patient that you've treated not refer to you for second? How many, I actually, try, I actually don't understand. Do you understand the question? How many, the question was how many cases do I have complicated, have I come with patient that you have not, you have treated not referred to you for second opinion treatment? 
So how many of my patients treated that's been gone to somewhere else for complication? Um, I'm going to be quite cocky here. I would have thought that uh, I do have a very good rapport with my patient. I actually insist to see every single cases of my patient whom I have treated personally and I am pretty convinced that almost all of them will come back to see me if there's a problem because they get to see me at about two to four weeks after the treatment and they know that you know to at least call us back or come back to see me so what percent of the cases might expect issue post treatment well there is no such thing as a ideal product as I have shown you before some of the complications are technique related which we just we as an injector just have to be uh, improve our technique and learn from our complication from the product itself well I can't really pinpoint uh, I've had three cases in the last seven years and if in all the three cases uh, I have to say that they are all technique related. I'm aware of some cases of perhaps granuloma formation and that's almost certainly, you know, um, we don't know what's a cause, it could be a subclinical infection. But we also know that there are some immune related complication that no one have the, um, have the answer for it, but I can say that categorically we know that every single product, particularly those slightly long standing, will have some of those problems, but it is by far extremely low. Uh, it will be in the vicinity of you know less than one percent. So if we can go to the next questions, do we have another questions? While we're waiting, uh, Bernice, I'll get you to clean the patient. So, uh, we had that question before. Can we move on to the next one? Yeah. Now that I have some time, can I pick it myself now? Or yeah. Can I? Let me just start. We'll just show it to you in the camera. So we've got two. Which one did you get to just before? Uh, did you go through them as well? Scroll down. Okay. Okay, so okay, the next now how do I how do I select? Which one? I want to select this. So you go like this. Okay. And then we'll just hit refresh. Okay. Question. Okay, so the next question is um, when pushing sub Q, is it anti grade or both anti grade and retrograde? With anti grade, is there increased risk of complication? Okay, I've answered the last bit. Uh, no, anti grade does not increase the risk of complication on the proviso that when you inject, you're not really putting all the force into the plunger and trying to get the whole syringe in one push. Um, I think whenever you come to injection, your right thumb will be your, you know, the most important tool you have. It controls the rate. My injection technique is always tend to be a fairly slow, continuous flow. So I do not believe there's any um, <clears throat> difference between anti-grade or retrograde. I like anti-grade because, as you can see, I use very small amount of local anesthetic and I'm relying on the local anesthetic in the product to anesthetize the area before I actually push my cannula through. So basically, I'm constantly putting a small volume of sub-Q with lidocaine in front of my can cannula so that the area is already numb before the cannula reach there. So that becomes very, very comfortable for the patient. And then of course, when I withdraw the cannula, I also put some retrograde fashion so that I am being quite efficient in my movement. So that I can do this with minimal stroke and minimal passes. Um, 
let's move on to the next questions okay the next question is in why do I choose perlin over restylane for the tear trough um, uh, it's a very good question I think it comes down to personal um, personal choice perlin of course is a little bit firmer than restylane and and my personal feeling is perhaps with the increase in cross linkage it also perhaps reduce the degree of swelling but if you're going to use perlane we know that it's a firmer product you've got to make sure you place it very very deep right on the bone there's no reason why you cannot use restylane for this area you can certainly do it um, and but you know uh, it's just a personal preference there's really no difference, no difference in longevity. Uh, but I will not use wrestling sub Q in the tear trough for the reason I mentioned before, because it with a high G prime, with a larger molecule, you really cannot get away with it with so little amount of soft tissue covering the tear trough region. Um, okay. Um, the next question is do you think you ever inject products superior to the orbicularis retaining ligament and do you think it's matter? Um, the answer is yes in some patient I do inject it more superficial superficial to the um, um, the retaining ligament that is within the muscle um, and the reason being is of course you know uh, Michael Kane has taught us that he routinely injected um, he felt that is just underneath the skin my feeling is it's almost impossible to do it under the skin you probably place a product in the superficial layer of the orbicularis muscle closer to this to the skin that really does not matter the matter is you can get away with it and all you've got to be absolutely sure is you actually almost place no product there you're placing 0.001 amount of product uh, and I do that for patients who have significant soft tissue um, um, laxity where you know that by placing it deep you can improve most of the tear trough but there's still some um, laxity and some uh, deficit in the superficial component those are the ones that I will go in the superficial plane but it's something that I will not recommend for beginners because I think if you are <clears throat> not that experienced you may place too much product and creating lumps um, Tyndall sign and and product visibility uh, yes the next question is can you use cannula for the tear trough the answer is of course you can use cannula in the tear trough um, um, I certainly has done it in the past and I certainly uh, continue to use it for those patients where the patient presented with a dark shadow under the eyelid not because of the true tear trough because they have an anatomical retrusion of the orbital rim where I use the product if you think of it almost like using uh, putting a layer product along the bony margin to push the bony margin forward almost like doing a bone grafting but I use it with uh, cannula but for a common variety uh, tear trough I tend to use a lot more needle simply because I feel that I can do it as efficiently perhaps faster more precise with the needle and create the same amount of bruising where I use needle uh, cannula so um, hopefully that answers your question the bottom line is it doesn't really matter whether you use a cannula or needle the most important thing is you've got to be absolutely sure that you are getting the product where you want it to be there is no point of using cannula if you believe that you can cause less bruising but not producing the optimal result at the end of the day you still want to produce an excellent result even 
if it means that you give the patient a bit more bruising because I think the patient will be ultimately more forgiving if you create a bit more bruising but give them the result that they wish for rather than no bruising and get a suboptimal result um, Okay, so the question was um, the question was one of my nurses uh, have to have five doses of hyaluronic days and may need more. Am I just unlucky? One side had to be drained percutaneously, it was sterile. Um, I, if you can just pose me another question, I'm not sure what complication you're referring to. Whether you're referring to a nodule, a heart lump, or whether there's actually a frank abscess. And for that particular uh, person, if you won't mind, pose that question to me again and try to make it a little bit more specific. Uh, telling me exactly what the problem is was whether it was recurrent swelling, recurrent nodules or recurrent infection. Okay, the next question was from Melbourne. Question one, what did you find when you perform open drainage? Um, so what did you find when you perform open drainage? Well, um, when I perform open, the cases that I've performed open drainage, there were frank pus uh, in one of the patient, and in the bottom of it, you can of course see some of the product within the pus. Um, in patient where I have to put a needle through, you can actually feel that it gone through a layer of thick fibrous tissue. And that's why I know that in those patients, unless you put the needle straight down within the lesion and get the product out, even if you squirt a large amount of hyaluronidase, you're not going to dissolve it for that reason. Um, um, and the next question was from the same uh, person in Melbourne, do you think that all subcutaneous placement encapsulate? Otherwise, how does it maintain its form? Okay, um, no, I do not believe that all subcutaneous placement encapsulate. Subcutaneous placement encapsulate if you put a big bolus of product in one area. If you put a micro droplet of product or tiny little track of product, it doesn't get encapsulate because you will get a vascular ingrowth, a tissue ingrowth within the product. You will only get a sub -Q, um, encapsulation if you put a big block of product um, um, into one area, simply because the product lasts a fair amount of time. And as you know, with inflammation, you will lay down a little bit of collagen and you have a lot of foreign body there, you create a, a foreign body reaction. Um, let me just move down. Okay. Um, do you recommend changing the cannula between the two sides? Now, <clears throat> I know this is certainly the recommendation uh, from the company, but I'm I don't know the answer, but I know that I don't do it in my office. Um, you just have to be mindful of where you put the cannula. So you can't see the setup with here. Now all the patients who have sub -Q, we open up a dressing pack. And I also do not place the cannula directly on the dressing pack. I tend to put it within the sheath the sheath of the cannula to maintain sterility because if you know for some reason you may accidentally contaminate your dressing pack so that's that's how 
That's why I don't change it. Of course, if you inadvertently touch a cannula, you should change it because you contaminate it. If the patient has a thin, empty skin, what is recommended? If the patient has very, very, very thin uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue, I would in those cases use perlane uh, rather than sub-Q because even though you can get away with it, you might see uh, a sort of a, uh, the, the edge of the, the implant rather than a smooth transition. Um, the next question has been the, okay, what prophylactic dose of Keflex? I use one gram. There is no empirical study to support it. And the reason I use this is we know that with any surgical intervention, be it um, uh, a, a simple gallbladder, a clean gallbladder removal, or a large cutaneous lesion, excision, a one dose of prophylactic antibiotic has been shown to reduce uh, post-operative infection. Now, I know that this is not an open procedure, but I feel that by giving a, a foreign material into, a, into the human body, and, and I know that the product do last a significant period of time, and I look at this as almost like doing open procedure, hence I give them one dose of prophylactic antibiotic. But you're quite right, there is no empirical evidence to it. Um, yeah, so why do I keep continue doing so? Uh, because for the reason that I've mentioned before, I just look at this as some sort of a foreign body material, I just want to eliminate the risk. Okay, how much post-treatment swelling are you likely to experience? For this patient, um, I will not envisage her to have a lot of swelling simply because two things. Um, we know that the hyaluronic acid is um, hydrophilic. It will absorb a lot of fluid, but not restless sub-Q. And the second thing is, I like, I believe that I have demonstrated to you a very atraumatic way of doing the procedure with gliding of the cannula with minimal force through um, a plane where there's minimal resistance. The only resistance that I have shown you that I have encountered is when I push the cannula through the orbicularis muscle. The rest was basically through a very loose areolus tissue. There's a nice surgical plane there, so I do not envisage a lot of swelling. Um, what do I think of the longevity? I think that patient was starting to come back to see us at about nine months, but if you are truthful, you have a good photography, you'll see that most of them still have the product. So how, do I, how long do I think? I, I think they last for about 12 months. A patient will feel that they have lost most of the product because they got used to most of the bulk of the product. So I'll tell them 12 months, but I routinely get them to come back to see me at about 8 to 9 months to see whether they need a second treatment. Um, I'm going to choose the last questions. If that's okay, Richard? Yeah. Uh, let me just see whether... In fact, I've actually answered most of the questions. Okay, the last question is actually very good. How do you minimize shelf appearance of the lower orbital rim when injecting cheek in the lean tissue, in the lean patient? Um, these are the patient when you inject a cheek. You don't, don't want to inject too much product. I will put the main bulk of the product a little bit, a lot lower than the infraorbital rim, just like what I've demonstrated, because there is, there's not a lot of fullness in the infraorbital rim or directly 
uh, at the inflow of the rim. You always have a slight gap and then gradually uh, move on to a slope into the peak of the mound. So I would put most of the product at least about two centimeters away from the um, from the orbital rim so that you get a gentle slope uh, to that area. Um, I hope that answered most of your questions. Um, because of time issue, I'm going to stop the webcast now. Um, hopefully that answered most of your concern and hopefully that um, the demonstration as well as what uh, my personal experience have um, uh, debunked some of the concerns and some of the myth um, that oh sorry I meant to look at this camera debunk some of the myth uh, and some of the concerns recent sub Q because it is it is a highly versatile and effective um, product in creating a very nice sculpted cheek and if you place it in a deep plane, in an appropriate plane, you can create a nicely sculpted and soft appearance. And, and if I can just show you um, what uh, Vanessa is now, and she's been here quietly listening to the conversation. If you just look at the camera now, if we can zoom in as much as possible. Okay, this is her about 40 minutes after the injection. And if you look at her now, apart from this small dressing in there, and, and despite the fact that we do multiple puncture and tear trough, dare I say that she can really, you know, um, go to dinner tonight uh, looking good with no telltale sign that she had treatment. And, and, and relax for me now. You have to stop laughing. I know you're very happy. <coughs> Just relax. You can see, you know, the fact that this product is deep. Sure, you can feel a little bit of firmness now because this is immediate. And, and, and she still have this a fairly soft appearance and she has a sculpted cheek. Okay, there's nothing sharp about the face anymore. So to answer your question, how much swelling, I would think that she would have a small amount of swelling tomorrow. And that will only enhance her appearance because she will have this glowing appearance when she goes to work tomorrow. Um, so I hope um, that answered most of your concerns. Um, and, um, and get rid of most of your fear in using this product because I really, really do not believe all those fears are founded. Um, if we use a proper technique, do what the product's been designed to do, use the appropriate size cannula, be very rigid and be very, very, very um, cautious and anal with your way you sterilize, use the chlorhexidine. Okay, good night to you all. Thank you so much.